we'll start the presentation. So since we're we're all here concerning the, the Red River Basin, I think it's important to put Agassiz in context in the, in the watershed and how we, how we function here. So Agassiz Refuge is located approximately 24 miles north of the city of, of Thief River Falls. We sit in the Thief River watershed. We sit in the, the, the Thief River watershed, which is just over 1,000 square miles or 670,000 acres. Of that watershed, 60% flows through Agassiz National Wildlife Refuge, and 52% of that water watershed flows through this structure that we're standing on today. Um, there are 16 ditches that bring water into the refuge. The refuge captures that water and manages that water in 26 impoundments, utilizing 40 water control structures to provide that migratory bird habitat which we're tasked to do by our executive order. During peak migration periods, the refuge will have roughly 100,000 uh, waterfowl in fall migration, and in the spring nesting season, we'll have approximately 7,500 pairs of ducks nesting on the refuge. Geese are a real observable species on the refuge and will we'll peak around 25,000 Canada geese. Uh, that are on the refuge throughout throughout the year. Um, those 26 pools range in size from 100 acres to 10,000 acres. The largest pool is Agassiz Pool, which is right here on the upstream side of, of this water control structure and this levee here. This radio gate structure was constructed in 1967 for the cost of $725,000. The first water control structure at this site was constructed in 1940, shortly after the refuge was established. So the reason this water control structure sits here is because this ditch right here is Judicial Ditch 11. It's the primary conduit of water for the northern half of the, of the watershed. We sit about two and a half miles upstream of Ditch 83, or how everybody refers to it as the Thief River. This ditch runs approximately four more miles through Agassiz Pool, then it continues on east to get to Beltrami County. Um, as far as the one of the biggest management concerns uh, and factors that we have to deal with on the refuge in managing those 26 impoundments is cattail expansion on the refuge. Wetlands comprise about 37,000 acres of the 60, of the, of the 61,000 acre refuge. So cattails are, are a big concern for us and the expansion of that cattail into the open water habitat significantly reduces that quality habitat that we're tasked to provide. The other impact that cattails pose is when we have expansion of those cattail stands, they actually take up space in, the, in those wetlands. So in effect, reducing the amount of storage capacity that we have on the refuge. So storage capacity is not uh, a primary mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service at Agassiz Refuge, but it's a secondary benefit that we're able to provide because of the management strategies that we do. So because Agassiz Pool is our, is our largest wetland, we have focused a lot of our um, management ideas and research on this pool. And what we found is that the amount of increased, uh, increasing sediment that's being brought in and transported into the refuge because of those, the ditch system, we're seeing that sediment accumulate to the point where cattails are able to start encroaching out further and further into that habitat. So Whitney can talk about some of the, the research that we've done that illustrate the, the severity of the sedimentation that we've seen on the refuge. Yeah, so just a reminder, I'm the biologist here. Um, my name is Whitney Kreschel. And um, so as Jim mentioned, um, one of our big issues here is sedimentation and the expansion of, of cattails. So um, to kind of get at this issue, um, there was a study conducted in 2008 by USGS. And they basically had two objectives. Um, they wanted to see, first, how much sediment has accumulated in Agassiz Pool since 
the refuge was established, and then also what's the source of that sediment. So is it ditch bank erosion or is it um, surface runoff from agricultural fields? So what they did was basically take sediment cores from Agassiz Pool and also um, some of the tributaries that flow into and feed Agassiz Pool, um, and they did isotopic, radioisotopic analyses as well as um, sediment fingerprinting um, to, to get at these objectives. And um, what they found was essentially both um, Ditch 11 and Agassiz Pool have been acting as sediment sinks since the establishment of the refuge. And um, using the sediment coring methods and the radioisotopes, they are able to estimate that about 1.3 million tons of sediment has accumulated in Agassiz Pool since, um, or between 1940 and 2008 when they did the study. Um, and so that basically equates to about 19,000 tons of sediment entering and settling out into that pool each year from upstream sediment sources. Um, and then for Ditch 11 alone, that held about 20, or 286,000 tons of sediment. Um, and so what they were hypothesizing is that um, Ditch 11 filled in first and basically acted as a buffer for Agassiz Pool, but then once that was filled in, you know, sediment was um, you know, entering Agassiz Pool and settling out there. Um, so um, based on these measurements, they were able to estimate that about an average, um, an average amount of um, six inches of sediment depth had accumulated across Agassiz Pool, um, but this wasn't uniform. So in the deeper parts of the pool, we had about four inches of sediment um, accumulation, and then around the fringes of the pool and in the tributary inlets is about um, 10 inches of sediment. Um, so um, uh, using the sediment fingerprinting method, they are able to determine that the sources of this sediment filling in the pool was largely from agricultural runoff versus the ditch bank erosion. Um, and just to give you some context of the watershed, there are about 1,200 miles of ditches in the Three Feet River watershed. And a lot of these ditches lie upstream of this refuge. Um, and there was a report from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that estimated about 96% 96, um, 96 of the stream miles in the watershed um, are considered altered or hydrologically modified, um, which isn't that surprising um, based on kind of land use patterns. Um, and then similarly, a, a DNR report, um, a fluvial geomorph geomorphology report also found that most of the streams in the, or the ditches in the watershed are considered unstable. Um, and so things like um, channelization and high frequency discharge events and the lack of riparian buffers can all contribute to that um, sediment entering the, the waterways. Uh, another thing to note is that um, in Marshall County, so not the watershed, but the greater Marshall County, we've lost um, 86,000 acres of CRP land so just since 2011. So that likely also influences the amount of sediment that's entering um, the channels and potentially affecting um, the refuge. Um, so as Jim had mentioned, uh, when we were losing this water depth in Agassiz Pool, we're also likely losing water storage capacity. Um, and that's also um, affecting the expansion of hybrid cattail. Cattail is an aggressive, very tolerant, emergent wetland plant, and it forms these dense monocultures, as you can see. Um, and that actually provides a positive feedback for more sedimentation. So it, flows, or it slows the velocity of, of the water and, and um, affects the, the sediment infilling. Um, in addition, the, the sedimentation can also affect um, the seed banks of other species. It doesn't take much for sediment to bury native seeds and um, prevent germination. It also can bury um, eggs of aquatic inverts, which are really important for migratory bird food. Um, so it kind of just has this <laughs> exacerbating effect on the overall quality of, um, of the wetland. Um, we've also, along with the sedimentation, had a lot of nutrients entering the refuge, as you can imagine. Um, there was a separate USGS study done in 2012 that found more nitrogen entering the refuge than leaving or entering the wetlands. And then we also have elevated levels of phosphorus. 
And of course, wetlands can act to reduce nutrients in wetlands, but that doesn't necessarily translate into a quality wetland or an ecologically diverse wetland. So um, the high nutrient input is also something that we're um, concerned with um, and, and that likely affects um, the wetland habitat. And unfortunately, research has also found that hybrid cattail responds really well to high, nu high nutrients so, um, versus the native cattail, so that can also be an issue as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, in light of that research that has been done, um, the refuge knew we needed to do something to save our save our wetlands and and manage the health of those to be able to to meet our mission. So, in 2013, the refuge held a structured decision making workshop where we had um, uh, uh, partners from the entire watershed, landowners. Um, scientists, wetland scientists that participated in that in this process to determine uh, what the best course of action is going to be to maintain the health and hopefully improve the health of the wetland. So what came out of that process uh, was a decision to use multiple approaches and natural processes to uh, minimize and hopefully reduce the amount of sedimentation within and coming into the refuge. So. In the fall of 2013, the refuge conducted its first fall drawdown, and the reason we did that was to, to mobilize those sediments that were in Agassiz Pool and coming into the pool uh, from those, those upstream off-refuge sources and allow that sediment to continue on its natural course downstream of the refuge. The two other uh, strategies that we used were the, the maintenance and the cleaning of the ditch systems within the refuge to remove that sediment to allow for better and more efficient flow of water. And another benefit of cleaning those ditches is it allows for future sediment trap. So we'll be able to concentrate those sediments in those cleaned out ditches so that sediment doesn't get expanded out into the wetland basins and grow more cattails. So as we, man as we manage and maintain the refuge into the future, we'll be able to go to those linear sites and be able to excavate that sediment out of the refuge. Um, the other thing we are doing on the refuge is spraying those monotypic stands of cattails with herbicide. We've seen great benefits and great bird use in response of that. Both of those strategies, the the ditch maintenance and the cattail spraying um, has been provided through Outdoor Heritage Fund grants from the state of Minnesota. And because of the close working relationship that we have with the Red Lake Watershed District, they were able to administer two grants for us to allow us to do those, um, to do those, uh, those projects. So we're grateful for that relationship and continue that uh, communication and coordination with them on how we can better improve the refuge which helps the entire entire watershed out um, but one thing we need to talk about though for sure is the impact of, of sediment and allowing sediment to pass pass through the refuge and to distribute that in its natural course downstream um, the refuge coordinates annually with an annual impoundment meeting where we have participation from the Red Lake Watershed District and the DNR and the Fish and Wildlife Service, which are the three main managers of, of impoundments in the Thief River Watershed. Uh, the City of Thief River Falls participates in that meeting. And we have county commissioners that participate in that meeting. And that's a discussion on what our management strategies are going to be for the coming year and what our management strategies of the preceding year allowed us to do. Um, when we do our specific fall drawdowns, the communication with the city, specifically the water treatment plant and the manager at the dam ramps up. We communicate uh, prior to our drawdown, during, and then at the conclusion of our drawdowns. And and through that process, when we're actually doing the drawdown, communication um, can be on a daily basis 
with the city to let them know what our management actions have been and and the reason we do that is to provide accurate and real time information for the city so they know the amount of water and the volume that's coming down uh, to them um, <coughs> So one thing, um, one additional benefit of the, of the fall drawdowns that we've conducted almost annually, we haven't done it every year since 2013, we do allow for uh, you know, management to make decisions to alter that habitat so we're not staying in a constant, constant pattern. Um, but one of the benefits of doing that, and if we look at the fall of 2019, it kind of highlights the importance of doing these fall drawdowns for water storage. 2019, the National Weather Service said that the precipitation event that started in September of that year was the highest event in 125 years. So when the refuge drew down our wetlands in early September, we virtually had these pools almost dry by the 20th of September when those rains started. So the refuge was able to provide 68,000 acre feet of storage for the watershed. And that didn't go unnoticed. I had several um, discussions with landowners immediately downstream who were very thankful for the, for the fall drawdowns that we were doing. It, uh, it minimized the impact of the flooding in their crop fields because most of them still had standing crops at that, at that time of year. Um, one other thing to highlight as we as we look at the, the water storage that we're able to provide, if we go back to the 90, 1996 and 1997 flood events, the refuge provided a little over 100,000 acre feet of storage in both 1996 and 1997. Um, so water management in, in northwest Minnesota is, is an important discussion topic and it's only it's only made successful by communication and coordination with all the players in the watershed and Whitney's gonna talk about a future project that we're hopeful um, to put in place that will help with, uh, with the sediment issue and management of the refuge but will also benefit the entire watershed yeah, so we're working with the Red Lake Watershed District and also the DNR to potentially restore a section of the historic Mud River Channel. And it's a section that's been abandoned since um, sometime before the refuge was established. Um, so it's a relic channel and, and you know, it still has the stream banks, but it just kind of acts as a federal wetland right now. Um, so it's on the east side of the refuge and we're looking to potentially restore about six miles of that channel. and. Um, about anything that that we've discussed the drawdown that you mentioned what's the wildlife management purpose or benefit of that drawdown right so during that structured decision making process in order to control these cattails we have to have better mechanism to dewater agassi pool because if we keep water out there it's just going to keep germinating cattails so the intent there 
was to allow drainage to occur laterally off of Ditch 11 to be able to reach to the north and to the south and be able to draw that water out by the channels that are created by the movement of the water in the fall. So if we're able to dewater those areas and dry those out, we'll be able to control those cattails better. And the future plan, like long-term plan, is to recreate Ditch 11 and fill in these cuts off of Ditch 11 and put water control structures in so we can better manage the flow of water in a direct path through the refuge where we'll only take water when we need it for habitat management. Otherwise, these gates will be open and the course of water will continue. Okay, thanks. And that would also redo the sediment filling issue. Right. But yeah, we also hope to work with some scientists that were at that earlier workshop just to kind of revisit the drawdown idea and explore other options that are out there and see if we can do things differently or if we can continue with our current management process. So what do you do right now? Oh, sorry. I was going to say, what can come in after the cattails where you've sprayed? Are you looking to, can you get a grass community of some kind? Yeah, and our next stop, we'll be able to show you that. We'll show you those wetland plants that are coming back in after cattail spray. Yeah, great. How low is the water currently by comparison to what you would call normal? Well, it's at least where we originally thought it would be this year. Right. So what we're seeing is, you know, we have the water in the main ditch, and then it's those lateral areas that we're seeing that, that scouring effect because of our drawdown. Those are holding water right now, but the flats are all, are all dry right now, uh, providing great shorebird habitat. And, and as, as painful as it is to see our wetlands dry, you know, because we're so focused on, you know, trying to control mother nature and, and provide what we think is the best habitat, um, it is providing benefits and wetlands in a natural cycle, they dry out, so it kind of forced our hand, but it's a good thing. It's like I said, it's a little, little painful at times. Um, Whitney's been going out and doing some uh, vegetation analysis to see what is uh, coming back um, out there uh, on the mud flats. We are seeing a lot of cattail germination, so uh, hopefully um, we, can, we can restore water to a normal pool next year and flood out some of those some of those cattails that are trying to establish right now. Anything else? I'll throw one more at you. Back to cattails. So that must be a problem that a lot of refuges have across a very large swath of the country. Are you feeling like the management techniques that that work, you know, are starting to rise to the top and people are really getting a handle on what you can do, or is it still? kind of a, a problem that needs a solution and we haven't really figured it out yet. Right, so because of that structured decision-making workshop that was held in 2013, there was a, there was a peer review uh, paper that was published on that. And then after that, there was some further outreach to other National Wildlife Refuges to see the extent of cattail uh, growth on those refuges and to provide them that, that information and coordination. And, you know, we, uh, one of the refuges in Minnesota that's very similar uh, to ours is the Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge by, by uh, um, White Bear Lake, maybe. I, yeah, by St. Cloud, I guess, in that area. So we're working with them to try and evaluate what techniques have worked for us and what hasn't worked for us. One of the things we've seen is we originally started spraying our cattails with a glyphosate-based um, herbicide with fixed wing. And we were seeing maybe two or three years worth of control. And we've, we've recently switched to an Amazapir uh, habitat. Uh, it's a trade name habitat, um, which is, has to be applied by label uh, with a helicopter. And we're seeing um, at, you know, at least five year control okay. on those cattails. Amazapir, is that what it's yep. called? Okay. And the next pool we're going to go to was sprayed with with the mass up here. Okay. And um, some of the, the dead cattails that you see out here were also sprayed. That was sprayed with the with the grant that was administered by the Red Lake Watershed District. Um, so yeah, it's it's a matter of trying to communicate and figuring.
out yeah. what's different about each refuge. And, and yeah. Even the site, you know, is our, different. Our WMAs obviously have the same problem and are right. working through the same kind of thought process. Right. So yeah, we're gonna drive up to the next site. Um, Agassiz Pool will, will be on your right side all the way until we make a, a, a left-hand turn. So this is the largest pool, 10,000 10, acres. So good to go. All right. Is that on? Can you hear me? Not very well. This feels a little early. This is good stuff. Okay. Test. <laughs> yep. There we go. <laughs> Okay, just real inter quick introduction um, on this pool. What we're going to talk about here is adaptive management. And when we talk about adaptive management and adapting our management strategy, it's not talking about changing the goal of how we're, how we're managing this habitat right here. We're not changing that from providing um, optimal migratory bird habitat. But what we're doing is we're adapting to current changes and we're learning from past management practices to make better decisions as we move into the future. And Cody's going to talk about um, the management of, of this unit. Um, but one important thing I wanted to point out on, on this unit specifically is that this unit does not receive any direct flow from any upstream ditch system. So this allows us a lot of flexibility to make changes and, and tweak the unit here and for, to, to continue to provide um, the, the best habitat that we can. All right, so just to reintroduce myself, I'm Cody Olkison, the assistant manager here. So hopefully everybody can hear me now. I tend to talk a little quietly, but got this now. So, <laughs> um, so just to give you guys a feel where we're at, um, this is what we call pool eight, is what we're standing in right now. Um, just on the north side of the road is our northwest pool. Um, and we are on the very west side of the refuge. The road's probably a quarter mile up to the west. Um, and pool eight is just over 1,100 acres. Um, and it's predominantly flat, like most of the terrain on the refuge. Um, there's pockets of cattails, pockets of sedge meadow. Um, some willows growing on the, the eastern side and then there's three aspen islands toward the south side which you can see behind me here. Um, so this pool has been in a hundred percent drawdown since 2011 um, in an effort to reduce the dense stand of cattail that once was out here um, <clears throat> and to promote native species which you should be able to see some sedges and some bulrushes and stuff which is which is what we were hoping for um and so since this pool has been drawn down since 2011 the refuge received a grant from the outdoor heritage fund in 2016 to aerial spray this whole this whole pool so i think approximately 100 or 890 acres were sprayed using a helicopter and they they sprayed it with an amazapir based herbicide. Um, and so, as you can see, I mean, there's a lot less cattail than there used to be out here. There definitely is still some pockets, but some of those areas are areas that were actually missed when it was sprayed. And then towards the north end of the pool where we're standing at now, there is some deeper depressions. And so some of those areas still hold some, hold some water. Um, and so it's been wet enough to still s sustain some cattail growth in some of those areas. So that's, that's what we're seeing. Um, looking into the future, we would ultimately like to be able to manage this pool as a more of a seasonal wetland type um, to prevent any, any re-expansion of cattails. Um, seasonal wetlands are very important. Um, it can provide great foraging habitat for waterfall, um, shorebirds, and, and other migratory species. Um, and so to do that, um, in order to adequately manage it as a seasonal wetland, we need to reevaluate some of the water control structures out here. We have two inlets. Um, one structure comes from our northwest pool, another one on the east side of this pool. Um, and then there's an outlet down in the southeast corner that basically dumps right into the, the uh, 
Thief River essentially. Um, and we also need to do some survey work out here and obtain accurate bathymetry and or LIDAR data just to get a better idea of what the exact topography out, you know, is out here. Um, so with that, we are actually going to be meeting with uh, Ducks Unlimited out here potentially tomorrow or Friday um, to, to go around the refuge and look at a, a handful of wetland projects that they may be able to assist with or at least add their expertise. Um, this this being one of them, so hopefully we uh, we get something out of that. Um, one last thing to note is um, the fall of 2019, which if everyone remembers, this area was extremely wet. So this pool ended up flooding due to all the rainwater, and then this northwest pool eventually completely filled up and was flowing over the emergency spillway directly into this pool. Well. Anecdotally, that fall, the, the refuge staff noticed that this pool had the most, the highest concentration of ducks and sandhill cranes compared to any pool on the refuge during that during that time period. So it was, I wasn't here in 2019. Jim can maybe paint a better picture, but it's cool to hear about that. So that that's all I had. Jim, if you had anything else to add? Or... Yeah, so, so, being observant and seeing what's happening in the past when we had that flood event and observing and seeing how the birds are reacting to this type of habitat is the decisions that we that we have to make uh, and use that information um, and one thing with this pool is we can't we can't manage it as a semi-permanent pool like it was done historically you know we've learned our lesson there Cattails are too aggressive and they're going to come into this area and they're going to be a monotypic stand and there's going to be no bird habitat out here for migratory birds. So the, the plan is to manage it, like Cody says, as a, as a seasonal and temporary type basin and only put water in here during migrational periods when the birds need this type of habitat. And this is going to provide not only the refuge, but the entire watershed, uh, the seasonal and temporary type habitat that is lacking on the landscape outside of the refuge. We have thousands of acres of semi-permanent uh, wetlands on the refuge that provide that type of brood rearing habitat. But it's the, lim the, the most limiting habitat is the seasonal and temporary type basins that historically were on the landscape very shallow, they're only flooded for, you know, maybe a week or two up to up to a month, maybe in the spring or fall when we have those those high uh, precipitation events. And those during that spring migration, that's the most critical time, like Cody said, there, there's so many invertebrates in those wetlands that that's what the ducks uh, get their get their um, their car carbohydrates to continue the, the migration. So. We've identified that as, as, a, as a key area where we can improve the refuge. So that's what we're going to be doing here. And we have a couple other pools on the refuge that don't have that flow of ditch water. So we have that control. So we'll be mimicking what we're doing here. We'll use, we'll use the successes and failures that we experienced on this pool and we'll implement them on those other pools to try and manage the refuge to provide that diversity of habitat that the migratory birds need. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a lot of wetland wetland species out here. Um, you know the the sedges you see right here, um, uh, bottle sedge, right, Whitney. Yep. Uh, a lot of native species. The bull uh, the bulrush that you see. Um, there's some cattails. I was just standing in bulrush. Right there. So. Like our Franklin's gull colony, which has historically been one of the largest colonies in the in the in the Midwest region, um, we have seen over the last ten years a decrease in that population. And what happens is they will not nest in cattails because their preferred habitat is the more rigid structure that the bulrush provides. So as the cattails take over those areas, the Franklin's gulls have to find other areas to nest. So one thing I wanted to do is I just wanted to just to show you what what a, a 
real shallow core sample looks like out here. And it kind of illustrates the issue that we have with cattails because even though we have this pool drawn down, there's still quite a bit of moisture, even in a year like this, as dry as it is. But you can see, if you, if you feel that, you'll feel how moist and, and damp that is. But also look at the organic layer that's in there and you can see the old, you know, the old cattail tubers that are in there. And, you know, I mean, if we tried it, yeah, there we go. We can squeeze water out of it. <laughs> So that's the problem with cattails, is that there's still, there's still moisture. And the biggest thing with cattails, in order to get those under control, is you have to break that cycle. You have to, you have to somehow break that cycle of that vegetative plant. And we originally tried to get uh, a cooperator, a farmer out here to disc this, but he just couldn't keep his tractor on top of the surface to do that. <laughs> so um, that was our original plan of the 1100 acres, I think they only did 100 and, 130 or 140 acres, so. Um, and what does it look like now, is it better? Um, that area, actually we're seeing quite a bit of willows coming back in that area, okay. so. That's one of those observations that we have to make and kind of evaluate yeah. to see like, well, why did that occur? Is that site maybe a little bit, a little bit higher, or a little bit lower in elevation? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was that farmer the one who lived on the um, west side of the refuge or north? West side, I think it was. Okay. Uh, I think it was Don Lunky yeah, who did that for us. The other one I was thinking, how many times did a wagon wheel did it take for you to convince him to come out here with right. his tractor? Right. Wagon wheel is the local watering hole. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Do you but, uh, do you do any burning? Yes. Okay. Yep. And that was one of the things we implement after we do a burn in a unit like this, where we where we can dry it out. When you spray those cattails, you can burn them, but generally you have to burn those cattails within, uh, so generally we spray uh, when those cattails are going into senescence, so when they're actually taking uh, nutrients down and putting them into the soil to overwinter. So if you spray at that time, which is generally, you know, as close to a frost as you can, you can get it, so, you know, late, late August, fall. early September. Okay. Um, so you would have that fall and the next spring to burn those cattails. Otherwise, those sprayed cattails, I think they just hold too much moisture and we can't get them to burn after that. So you do have that, that opportunity okay. and that, that really brief window to, mm -hmm. to and, burn those. And do you think that helps control the cattails or do you just do it more for other reasons to put nutrients into the soil and stuff like that? Um, if, it's, if it's following a, a herbicide application, it's necessary to open up that that area. But if it was just burning a cattail unit where mm -hmm. we didn't do any spraying, mm -hmm. then that's just the nutrient cycling yeah. that okay. we provide. And that's very, I mean, that's very beneficial too. I mean, research has shown that the, that the spike in species rich, richness and the amount of invertebrates that we have in those wetlands after we do a burn like that and release those nutrients, you know, is, is super high. So mm -hmm. we still, we still will burn even if we don't we don't do a, or an herbicide application okay. prior. Yeah. Does that slow the cattails up very much, a burn without herbicide? Not really. Uh, that first year, it'll it'll reduce the density. Um, we actually did uh, maybe 250 acres of cattail burning this winter on top of the ice. You know, we were such a dry winter, you know, winter that we probably haven't seen in, well, I know at least 10 years we haven't seen that here. So we were able to, to, to burn some of those areas. and. Whitney's been in some of those stands and you know the density isn't as, as dense as a stand that that you know that wasn't burned but it, it reduces it you know temporarily it's just that this year we were hoping to flood those areas to maybe prolong that effect of that of that winter cattail burning but um, but it's just not going to happen this year so yeah um, so as far as you know wetland species the um, why it's beneficial for these native species to get these established is you know you can't see it on, on a lot of these species but the seed heads that are that are being produced right now is what the migratory birds need so when you know when you when you flood this shallowly uh, they say you know 18 inches is about the optimal forage depth for dabbling ducks where they can tip down and get those and get those seeds so um, you know, anything below that is, is ideal habitat and sandhill cranes need that shallow water to roost in at night. Um, so 
providing that type of habitat with the with the seeds that we have available here and being able to, to flood that you know just is going to create you know incredible um, incredible habitat that the birds that the birds need and you can see that like this you know for us right here you can see it you know all those seeds right there mm -hmm. that are going to be falling off in the winter time so um, <laughs> So yeah, this is the this is the this is the response that we're looking for in these wetlands. This is it, and you can see it. I don't know, Cody, if you mentioned it, but when we when we leave, we'll basically be driving off the refuge and we'll be going on the western boundary of the refuge. So this is Pool Eight. When we go on that next gate, we'll, on your left, we'll still be Pool Eight. So you'll be able to see this type of habitat um, the whole way. And and pay attention, you'll see strips of cattails where the helicopter missed. So you'll be able to see like what it once looked like before we had sprayed that. And on the way here, I noticed it was all cattails. I mean, we were just driving around mile after mile of cattails. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, what kind so, of mammals do you get here? Mammals? Um, I mean, we have wolves, moose, um, fisher, weasels, um, beavers. Um, mink. What else am I missing? Deer. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have a Cats. lot. What's that? Bobcats. Yep. Yeah, Jim yeah. saw one this spring. This spring. Yeah. yeah. That's weird. Really, I wouldn't have thought they would be here, but they are. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, do the moose in this area just exist on the refuge in like an isolated pocket? Because I, I, that seems to be well outside of what is reported for most of the surrounding counties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a core area here, but the people in Pennington County and Red Lake County and, um, you know, further South Polk County, they do see those occasional uh, moose. And Whitney was lucky enough to see a cow and a calf a week, maybe a week ago. So mm -hmm. that's generally been uh, been an annual occurrence. Somebody on staff will see a cow and a calf. So they are, they are reproducing. We're just not seeing any big increases in numbers. So, yeah, it's kind of a core area. Um, so, you know, we have the 61,000 acres refuge here, and then there's an additional 25,000 acres of state land that border our south uh, and east boundary. So there's a good core area of habitat. Yeah. I grew up, uh, that's about six miles north of here. And in the 70s, 80s, when you make a deer drive, you chase out more moose than that. <laughs> in 1975, was really bad for deer and the deer numbers were really low, moose numbers were high. I mean, we used to just make drive after drive and chase moose out and no deer. And that's how it's changed, yep. you know, from the 70s right. to 80s, early 80s. Right. So there, I know there's a meeting coming up that we're going to participate in with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to, uh, to discuss, you know, moose management and, and that here in the next next, next week next yeah. week so we'll part you know participate in that we always you know during that whole decline of the moose population the refuge here was uh, instrumental in getting some educational type programs out to the schools where we actually allowed them to monitor movements of collared moose so that was that was a good educational uh, opportunity that we that we took advantage of so yeah, we're we have we have the area, and if we can um, do some management techniques to help. For years, we were we were mowing willows in the winter time to provide that regrowth in the spring for those, uh, those young fresh shoots for the for the moose to browse on. So that's something we haven't done because of the low numbers of moose. But um, if that's something that's identified as as needed to try and help this population along, we would we certainly do that again. Who's old enough to remember Wild Kingdom? I'm aging oh, myself yeah. again. So they did it. Martin, Merlin Perkins, um, head guy for and his sidekick, teamed up with Articat Enterprise to do a, a a whole feature show on collaring a moose, mm -hmm. and it was done at Agassiz. Yeah. Um, probably in the mid '70s, yeah. early '70s. Right. Marlon was in the office. Jim was out taking. Jim was out there. Yeah. Actually, Marlon was out there, but Jim was the one doing all the grunt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That was quite a highlight for our area back in them days to have huh. a national renowned wildlife show to come yeah. do something yep. in our areas. Yep. 
So I, I was talking to some other people about some uh, some impoundment management and, and the issues with with cattails and you know the thing we've realized is is it's really hard to manage a pool as a semi-permanent basin and not be you know and, and not be able to control those cattails you, you have to be able to dry it out and somehow break that cycle on those cattails otherwise you're never gonna get ahead of it um, and it's a it's a long process you know we see something like this and it's like man let's shove some water in there and you know see what happens but we're gonna you know we're gonna have ducks unlimited out here to help us through the thought process on if we can um, make some changes to our infrastructure and look at some elevations and see how best we can uh, spread this water out on this landscape that's what we're going to do and we'll and it will only be during those uh, I'm thinking right now it would be only during those those fall periods because if we flood this area in the spring if we get into a wet cycle and we're not able to dewater this area well then we've lost what we've what we've gained and we're going to have cattails back so we can utilize it in the fall um, the thing with flood storage on the refuge I you know I've been um, specific to say that that's a secondary benefit but generally and the reason that is is because this is a migratory bird refuge and our first task is to manage for migratory birds but once that period of time is gone like it was in September of 2019 then we can store water because we're not impacting those nesting bird species so that's something that this pool would offer we would be able to we would be able to open up the structure on the Thief River right here on the east side and we would be able to allow that water and increase the, the flood storage that the refuge can provide. Any other questions?